Eddington Medal and more recently the Rock Medal. Um, one more thing before we start the talk is that after the talk we'll have committee elections, so if you're interested, please do stay for that. Um, and Professor Bini is going to talk about the foundations of quantum mechanics today. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Bini. Thank you. Well, thank you for this opportunity to, uh, I've turned this off, I hope that's okay to, because, of the, because of the noise, but tell me if you want it on. I'll try to speak clearly. So thank you for this opportunity to speak to the other side of the uh, hard sciences and I, in, and I feel slightly in the lion's den here in the sense that here I am, an astrophysicist talking about quantum mechanics to the people whose whole subject revolves around that. Um, all right, so. Uh, Ooh. Not yet there, sorry. Let's move on. Um, so here's my outline. I'm going to talk about the background, uh, and in particular about the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which I feel very hostile to. And then I'm going to talk about what makes quantum mechanics, what I think makes quantum mechanics different from classical mechanics, what the essential difference is, uh, and about reproducible measurements, their allure, and, their uh, and why, why they're then incompatible with one another, how we actually measure, talk about probability amplitudes, the quantum mechanics of composite systems, entanglement density operators, the sort of technical background to uh, to the theory of measurement, to, to, to understanding what really happens during measurement, and then I'll describe a, a model of measurement, which I think is an unproved conjecture, but I think it's something that we should be in a position to, uh, to make progress with. I think people, it would be nice if people did make progress with it, so now we're going the wrong way. Okay, this is a commercial break, so just released by Oxford University Press is this, uh, this volume which grew out of the, uh, my teaching of quantum mechanics to the second year, to the... Um, to, to second year physicists, uh, and it's just appeared in, quantum, uh, in Oxford University Press. There is a version of this available for free on my website, but that's the third edition, this is the fourth edition, and there, on the things that I'm talking about today, there's been something of a shift, and I think this is much better. Uh, okay, so background. Um, so I'm sure, I, th I feel very strongly that the development of quantum mechanics was one of the great intellectual achievements of our species. It's an astonishing, it was amazing how in a, in a mere handful of years, uh, a, a pretty much of a handful of people created this extraordinarily beautiful and powerful theory. And our civilization now completely depends on the correctness of this theory because it completely depends on electronic devices which depend on band structure of silicon, et cetera, uh, which uh, were understood in the 1930s on the basis of, of quantum mechanics. Without quantum mechanics, our modern world would not exist. So it's not an academic topic, it's, it's vital for the human enterprise. But nonetheless, quantum mechanics even getting on for 100 years, 100 years after it began to emerge, uh, what we're, we're approaching 90 years since it did emerge, uh, 85 years, whatever, remains a controversial uh, uh, subject. And in Scientists have always made corrections 
from disturbance caused by measurement. Not in every case, in many cases. If you were observing the moons of, uh, of Jupiter, the disturbance caused by your measurement, there is a disturbance because you, you are picking up photons. You've been bounced off the moon from the sun. So um, there is a disturbance of the moon by virtue of the fact that you're measuring it, but this disturbance is totally inconsequential. When you're dealing with small things like atoms, this disturbance is, not, is by no means inconsequential. It's a very important phenomenon, uh, and it's not one that you can make go away by having ever more refined measurements. So when you are doing measurements on an electrical circuit, um, you are aware, so if you want to know what the voltage is across some element of an electrical circuit, you put down terminals either side and allow uh, the voltage to drive a tiny current through some circuit. So you put down uh, some circuit, the terminals of a circuit that has the highest possible impedance so that you get the smallest possible current. But you can't take no current through, your, through the device that's measuring the voltage or you wouldn't get any kind of a signal. You have to have some kind of a current and that means that you change the voltage across there. You're going to reduce the voltage and uh, uh, what the standard physicist or chemist or whatever would do is then... Um, is try and estimate the magnitude of this effect and correct for it. That's why there are systematic, one corrects systematically for errors, uh, experimental errors. So there is, measurement comes with disturbance, but when you're dealing with a really small system like an atom, uh, there is a, the, you, you, you cannot make this disturbance de minimis. You can't make it so that it's a tiny, it's merely a, a small effect for which you can decently correct. It becomes a first order thing. So, and I think that's the key thing about quantum mechanics is that it, it recognizes that. So physics is about predicting the future. That's soothsaying, right? That's the essence of physics. That's the magic in it, that you can, you can on basis of information of the situation now, the configuration of the solar system now, you can predict what the solar system is going to be like in a year, 10 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can, on the basis of experiments previously conducted and theories developed, uh, you can predict uh, what kind of phenomena will appear in the LHC and so on and so forth. It's, it's, physics is very much about predicting the future. Um, but if a measurement disturbs the system, it will clearly change the future of, of that system. So that means that, the, that when you come to the conclusion that every measurement is a disturbance, you have to include that disturbance in your theory. It has to become part and parcel of the theory that you then use to predict the future. But that's, very, that's a really scary conclusion to arrive at because every measurement is different. I mean, different people use different equipment. There are different ways of measuring the same thing. And it, uh, we want to, but science depends upon making general statements. Uh, science depends upon getting, deriving understanding by thinking about things in, when they're reduced to stereotypical, simple situations where uh, you can make broad brush uh, statements. When you come to predict what's going to happen in some particular circumstance, it may be okay to incorporate the particular experimental kit you're going to use. But when you're framing general laws, it's no good. Uh, you, we, we need to have something like Maxwell's equations, which describe the behavior of electromagnetic fields and, and, and charges without any reference to how those electromagnetic fields and charges are measured. We don't want to be, have a theory of electromagnetic fields and charges when you use a Siemens Type 32 electrometer in conjunction with a something else magnetometer with a different theory for every, that won't work. Science depends. So we have to include the disturbance caused by the measurement, but we have to be very careful how we do that. So, and if, if you can't find a decent way of finessing this, of, of, of talking in general about measurements, the disturbance caused by measurement, you really do threaten to undermine. It goes to the heart of the viability of the whole scientific enterprise. So what was the Copenhagen solution? And I don't think this is a conscious solution. I think this is an example of people who, who arrived at an incredibly clever way of handling a difficulty without thinking too explicitly, uh, being too clear about, about the solution. At least I've read uh, uh, Heisenberg's memoirs and I don't see anything about this in there. Okay, so 
um, the idea is to focus, the idea was to focus on reproducible measurements because every classical scientist knows that a good measurement is reproducible, a bad measurement is not reproducible, right? If, you've, if your a kit is subject to all kinds of, uh, of random errors, um, you repeat the measurement and you get a significantly different answer every time you do it. Whereas if you are doing very precise, very satisfactory measuring, you repeat it and you get an answer that's very close to the previous one. And usually, whenever possible, we do repeat our measurements and, 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 and have a look at the ensemble of answers we get and in that way assess what our errors are and say that the truth lies somewhere in this cloud of data points that I have, I have recovered. So repeatability is, is good in scientific measurements. So they thought, well, let's focus on reproducible measurements because if we have a theory that describes reproducible measurements, we can easily, then, then each of us can develop, uh, can, can just trivially modify the predictions to predict what's going to happen when we make noisy measurements by just adding noise to the, to the predictions of the theory. Uh, so it's clearly a good way to go. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to say that if we measure, for example, the energy and we find the answer to be the machine returns the number E6 using uh, our, our idealized reproducible measuring equipment, uh, and then we remeasure, we're going to get E6 again. That's, that's a definition. I mean, it's that, that's that property that makes the measurement of energy reproducible and uh, the ideal measurement. The outcome of the first measurement was uncertain, was probabilistic, we, uh, um, but, the, but the, 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 subs the result of the subsequent measurement uh, was certain. And what the theory is going to do is going to deliver the probability that the uh, first measurement gave the number E6 or gave the number, there's going to be a, a probability P6 that it gave the answer E6, a, pro a probability P1 that it gives the answer E1, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so why is the, is the result of the measurement probabilistic in the first place? This, I mean, this very much worried. Einstein was, to the very end, totally unhappy, uh, was convinced that quantum mechanics, though it was, it, was, uh, it was something that produced, it was a theory that produced uh, very useful results, but it was some kind of staging post. It was only some kind of inadequate substitute for a deeper theory that would emerge later, which got rid of this probabilistic element. That is to say that the probabilistic element would go away when there was a proper theory, and you would realize that the only, the only reason that the the outcome of the experiments appeared to be random was because we were ignorant of some hidden parameters which, hidden variables, which existed and, you know, so randomness arising from ignorance is perfectly all right. Randomness that's quint that's essential is not all right. But I think, I think we, we now can understand why the outcome of these measurements is uncertain. It's because uh, we will inevitably be unsure of the state of the measuring kit before we make the measurement. The measuring kit is, is going to be a complicated dynamical system. It's going to be a much more complicated dynamical system than the system we're measuring because it has to be big enough that when we measure it, we don't have to worry too much about disturbance. Otherwise, we go into an infinite regress. So when you have, you bring one quantum system in touch with another quantum system, one atom coming in contact with another atom and something happens, you don't say that's measuring. That's just two systems interacting. And we, uh, we then have to somehow measure the result. Measurement consists in bringing uh, some measuring equipment which is big enough that uh, we, we, we bring this instrument into contact with the system that we're measuring, and then we uh, inspect the measuring equipment in a more or less classical way. It's big enough that we don't have to worry, that is to say, we don't have to worry about the uh, impact that our probing of it has on it. That means that it's going to be, in practice, a big thing. And, uh, and I'll, as I stress, sort of clarify in a moment, uh, our chances of understanding the initial configuration, precisely the initial configuration of the measuring kit are then negligible. 
So there's, there's uncertainty in the initial state of the measuring instrument, and that is reflected in uncertainty of the outcome. So because you don't know the initial state of the instrument, you don't know how it's going to disturb the system. Consequently, you don't know where the system uh, is going to end up. So, but if the system is top quality, uh, it's a reproducible instrument. As I'll stress later, that's a, an idealization, but that's the Copenhagen idealization. If it is top quality reproducible instrument, then the result of this disturbance is going to be a, to put our, the system we're measuring into a very special state, which is symbolized by this ket EI. And so putting a, putting a symbol like that in those pointy brackets means that that is a state of our, a quantum state of our system. I'll talk a bit more about what, what that exactly means. That's the ith quantum state, the special one, which has this weird property that if you measure, en you measure the energy of this state, you don't disturb it or you re-disturb it into the same place. So you are certain that this is the state in which you, this by definition is the state in which you are certain that the outcome of a measurement of energy is the number EI, provided you use a top quality instrument. Now, um, so the th in, the th in the subject, the things that we can measure, and of course there are many things we can measure, position, momentum, energy, angular momentum, component of spin, and so on, they're called observables. It's a terrible name because the whole point is that, that measurement is an active probing activity, not a passive activity. We are not observing the atom. We are poking the atom. We are interrogating the atom. Okay, so, but with each observable, we're going to, we, but, but having got this concept of a reproducible measurement, we're now locked into the idea that with each observable, there's going to be a set of states with the position uh, observable, there's going to be a set of, set of states, xi, uh, which have this weird property that if you re-measure position, you're going, to get, you're going to get the same answer that you got before. There's going to be, with the momentum uh, observable, there's going to be a set of states, pi, which has the weird property that you remeasure the momentum, you'll get the, same, you'll get the same answer. So this is the state in which the momentum is, a measurement of momentum will certainly return the value pi. This is a state in which a measurement of position will certainly return the value xi. And for all possible answers, there has to be a special state like this. And here we've already met that one. <coughs> And the point is that if you measure position with an ideal measuring kit, you will jog the system. Your disturbance will jog it into one of these states. You don't know which, and we compute the probabilities for which, but you will jog it into one of those. If you choose to measure the momentum, you'll jog it into one of those. If you choose to measure the energy, you'll jog into one of those. Um, OK. And uh, these are weird states because they have, for one particular ob observable, they have this non-disturbance property. But when you re-measure, you presumably re-disturb, but you re-disturb in such a way that you leave them in the same place. I don't think this is physical. I don't think this is real, right? This is a necessary consequence of the concept of a reproducible measurement. There's nothing here that says that a reproducible measurement is possible. There's nothing in geometry which says that a line can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, as Euclid says. There is no such line. There never could be such a line. I don't think, even Euclid, I don't think Euclid ever believed there was such a line. It's an idea. It's an idea that cuts through garbage, that simplifies things. It's an idealization. OK, now. It's, there's absolutely no reason to expect the special states, any of these special states xi, to coincide with any of those special states pi. Because what, whatever you do when you measure position, you're not measuring momentum. When you measure energy, you're not measuring momentum, you're not measuring position, you're measuring something else. So these, state, these special states, the, which you jog the system into if you measure one particular observable, are different. These, all of these states are different from all of those states, are different from all of the states EI. This is totally to be expected. What does that mean? Uh, 
Um, that means that if you're certain what the result is of measuring position, i.e. it's definitely in this state, then it's definitely not in one of those states, and you are uncertain what the consequence will be of measuring momentum. If you're certain what the result of measuring energy is, which we often feel we are, uh, so we're certain what, that it's in one of the states EI, it, we, it will be uncertain what will be the result of measuring position or momentum. There's nothing mysterious about this. This is a completely self-evident consequence of the concept of an ideal measurement. And the hypothesis that there exist states which have this non-disturbance property for one observable. Right. So I think I've covered those things. So the bottom line is, what, what we have to take from this is that position, momentum, energy, et cetera, as we have defined them. So these, these are obviously properties which are determined by the measuring process. They're not metaphysical properties. That in order that they make sense, they have to be numbers which we can write down in our lab book on the basis of some engagement, some measurement, some some interference with the system. These things are not intrinsic properties of the system. They are answers to questions. You can ask, a, you can ask an atom or an electron, what is your position? You can ask an electron, what is your momentum? You can ask an electron, what is the energy? Every time you ask a question, you disturb the system and you jog it into a special state where, by hypothesis, where a subsequent asking of the question leads to the same answer. So it's not mysterious that you can't have position well-defined and momentum well-defined at the same time. It's, it's a self-evident consequence of the, of the concept of an ideal measurement and the fact that making a measurement is going to cause a disturbance. And you can't expect that the disturbance caused by measuring position, which is going by hypothesis to drive it into a state xi, is going to protect it from being jogged into some other state if you choose to measure, subsequently choose to measure momentum. So the incompatibility of measurements, the, the X and P, or X and E, is a consequence of using the concept of an ideal measurement. Um, right. And so, so these, are, these things are not intrinsic properties, they are questions, and, after, and the asking of the question jogs the state, jogs the system into a peculiar state, if you use one of these idealized perfect measuring kits. Okay, so it's now completely obvious that if you measure some observable Q, you're going to cause the system, which initially was in a state we conventionally write like this of psi, so that's a generic state, whatever the state of our system is as we walk up to it, you're going to jog it from this into one of the special states, qi, that belong to the, op to the observable q. Right? This is a state in which if I re-ask q, the, if I re-ask the question, what is your q, I get the answer qi again. Um, so this is, this is a state which is defined by this. So the collapse of the wave function isn't something mysterious that needs to be explained by many wells sophistry. It's a self-evident consequence of the way we've, we're, we've chosen to talk about the measurement problem, which is a problem we have to address because we're dealing with small things which cannot be engaged with with infinite delicacy. Okay, now, it turns out that the special st these special states are unphysical. For example, the special state pi has a wave function which is a plane wave. That means that the, that the amplitude to find your particle here in the lab or on the other side of the universe is the same. If you have a particle in a state of well-defined momentum, you, it has equal probability of being anywhere in the universe. Clearly, there never was a particle that was in a state of well-defined momentum. It's an idealization. It's like, it's like saying that my, my point is somewhere, is anywhere on an infinite straight line. It's only it's even worse. It's an idealization. It isn't real. Um, if, uh, if a particle is in a state xi of well-defined position, mathematics tells us that 
uh, it has equal probability of being stationary or traveling at 10,000 or 100,000 kilometers a second. Again, it isn't, this isn't, this tells us that these states of well-defined position, momentum, or whatever, are not physical. They, in, in the sense that no particle in our laboratory, nothing we really are interested in, nothing that's real, was ever in any one of these things. They are mathematical fictions, like infinite straight lines, which turn out to be enormously useful, right? Completely, completely vital to the day-to-day -day business of computing probabilities, but they shouldn't be taken seriously as physical entities, which is connected to the fact that these perfect, these perfect measurement kits don't exist. We're talking idealizations, like uh, infinitely thin lines or infinitely thin planes. OK. So let's think a little bit more about the measurement business. What do we do? Well, we bring, we bring some kind of instrument into physical contact with the system so it can exchange any energy, momentum, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then we let them evolve for a short while while they're coupled together. I bring them into contact so there is some piece of Hamiltonian which involves both of their operators. And I let them, I let them evolve together for a short while. Then I take away the measuring instrument because I don't want to squash my, my atom or whatever it is I'm trying to study, and I examine the, and I examine the equipment. So the evolution of the instrument depends on the state of the system. That's the key thing. That's how the instrument makes a measurement, right? It's, it's sensitive to, uh, the, it has to have some sensitivity to the state of the system that it's measuring, and that takes the form of de, the, the, the dynamical evolution of the instrument uh, differs um, depending on the state that the system was in that it came into contact with. <coughs> but by the same token, the state of the system depends, of course, its evolution depends upon the state of the instrument before they're brought into contact. These are just two physical systems being brought into contact, and the evolution of one depends on the state of the other, both ways. So on the one hand, we get the collapse of the wave function. That is to say, the instrument, this ideal instrument, is, is going to drive the system into a special state. That's the state, of, that's the state of the system, depending on the state of the instrument. And on the other side, the bit that we, that's the bit we don't want. The bit we do want is we want that the state of our instrument depends on the state. These two things become correlated. The instrument, the system become correlated. OK. Um, so, we, so the whole thing is we, we bring them into contact, they become, they become correlated in the language of quantum mechanics, they, be, they become entangled, but it's just the same thing. Then we pull away the instrument and examine it. Uh, it's not said exactly how we do the examination, but by virtue of this correlation, uh, this, by looking carefully at the state of the instrument, we can draw inferences about the state of the system. So the instrument needs to be big enough so that we can, so it won't be seriously disturbed by the examination process. I've made that point already. Um, otherwise, we have an infinite regress because if we, if our system's so small that uh, it's readily disturbed, then we have to have, we have to go through the whole process again of thinking how we're going to, how we're going to get an understanding of the instrument. And it's unfeasible to know the state of a macroscopic system or even a mesoscopic system precisely. I'll quantify that in a minute. So we can't predict precisely how the instrument will modify the evolution of the system. And that's why measurement outcomes are uncertain. Because the outcome depends on the state of the system, sorry, the state of the instrument before, we, before it comes into contact with the, with the system. And that we can't know. Here's, here's a kind of illustration. So to determine the state of a system, you need to make measurements on it, right? You need, you need data to describe a state. Um, how, many, how many measurements do you need to determine the state of an electron? Well, the answer is four, because you've got to measure position or momentum, and you've got to, you've got to measure the A component of spin. A hydrogen atom, you need now to measure eight things. You've got to measure the position and momentum of the whole atom, something like the energy, the angular momentum of the reduced particle, more or less the electron, and then you've got to measure the, or the Z components of spin of the electron and the proton. If you buy an instrument from Siemens or Oxford Instruments or whatever, you have to measure about 10 to the 24 things because you'll have on the order of 10 to the 24 atoms, probably more actually, uh, and for each atom you've got to measure 
several, you know, on the order of 10 things. <laughs> so you need to make some extraordinary number of measurements in order to find the state of, of a macroscopic instrument. Even a, even a protein is going to take uh, hundreds of millions of measurements. So nobody's ever going to know this quantum state of a protein, even a protein. And all these discussions There is nothing mysterious about entanglement, it is merely the development of correlation. It's, it's, it's how one can describe correlation. But, so, um, it all started with the Einstein and Velocity Rosen thought experiment, which led to people like Zeininger's work, Anton Zeininger's work in Vienna, uh, with photons that have been taken by optical fibers to different sides of the Danube and they're still correlated and somehow they will tell you that there's some kind of mystery here. There is no mystery here. This is all totally boring. And it's, just, it's, just that the, it's just that the two photons started out correlated and they remain correlated when they cross the Danube and there's nothing, there's nothing odd about any of that. Okay, now people do find correlations a difficult concept. There's a whole issue of cause and effect and things are correlated Sometimes one's the cause, sometimes, the other, sometimes they have a cause-effect relationship. It can be kind of one way around or the other way around. Sometimes they're both caused by something else and so on and so forth. Uh, and market crashes arise because systems are very, because, because prices, uh, because things have correlations that people are strongly correlated, that people have pretended are not strongly correlated, because they find it hard, obviously not because they they ever were any doubt that they were correlated, but because they find it hard to compute, hard to cope with correlations, so we're always trying to pretend that things are uncorrelated which are actually correlated. It's very hard to deal with correlations. Now the only remarkable thing about correlation in quantum mechanics is the ease with which you can compute it. And I want to, I want to describe, because this, this, this correlation is so important for measurement, I want to go a little bit into the, into the mathematical background of formalism that quantum mechanics uses to, to describe correlation, but this little equation here, which I'll talk about in greater detail later, is, is how it does it. This is a state of, this is a state of, of system A, this is the state of system B, two, two distinct systems. Uh, this is a correlated state of system A and B, and the thing is, you can write a correlated state as simply a sum of uncorrelated states. Each of these products describes an uncorrelated state of A and B, and if you add together uncorrelated states in quantum mechanics, you get a correlated state. It's extraordinarily convenient and slick. Okay, so just, just to sort of uh, to clarify that, let's just, uh, and here I'm a little bit unclear <coughs> on what level I should be speaking, but uh, forgive me if this is too elementary. Probability amplitude, right. So the central mystery of quantum mechanics is that the way we compute probabilities, it's obvious that we're going to be computing probabilities, it's obvious this is going to be mathematically challenging, because, because instead of computing in, in classical mechanics, you compute the expectation value of probability distribution, because the probability distribution is so narrow that you don't need to know anything more than where it peaks. But in quantum mechanics, we're going to have all this damned uncertainty, so we're going to have to calculate whole probability distributions. We're going to have to calculate whole functions instead of single numbers. So it's clearly going to be mathematically challenging. What makes it tractable is that we compute these probabilities using these amplitude things. Instead of computing these positive, these non-negative numbers, we use complex numbers and we declare the probability to be the mod squared of appropriate complex number of the probability amplitude. So, and I, I, nobody knows why this works. Uh, in, probability theory is all over the physical and social sciences. It's, it's universally used. And in no other branch of probability theory does anybody compute anything using probability amplitudes. There are, there are 
there are hedge funds that call themselves quantum fund, um, and on all these quants are calculating probability distributions and correlation coefficients and all that stuff. They know use they, they call their, their fund the quantum fund, but they do not use probability amplitudes. And they would dearly love to, I'm sure. The trouble is it doesn't in their case work, and we don't know why it works here. And I never heard anybody say anything intelligent about this, it's just a mystery. Uh, but it's an extraordinarily convenient mystery. Okay, so the basic rule is this: that if something can happen in two mutually exclusive ways, uh, so it can happen by root one or root two, then and, and the probability that happens on well, the amplitude that happens by root one is a one, so the probability that happens by root one is p one, and the probability that happens by root two is a two. This is the probability of root, that it happens by root two. Then the probability that it happens one way or the other, I don't care which, is you add the amplitudes and do the mod square of the sum of the amplitudes, which doesn't just give you these two things. It gives you these two things plus uh, twice the real part of a1 times uh, a2 star. So the probability that something can happen in, in either way, never mind which, isn't the sum of the probability that it happens one way or the other way. So this is the rule. It works. Nobody knows why it works. Anyway, uh, right. So yeah, the sad example, of course, is the two stick interference experiment where an electron passes through, it has two slits it can go through, and if you blank off each slit, you can find the probability distribution that's riding through one slit, and you have both slits open, and you find that the probability distribution uh, with those slits open is not the sum of the individual probability distribution. So we know it's true. Um, okay, so so why why is this why why is it a wonderful fact that we have to calculate probabilities in this way? Well, probabilities have to be greater than or equal to zero, uh, and mathematically, this is a class one pain, having to compute numbers which have to be greater than or equal to zero. Because if you conduct almost any mathematical operation on uh, positive numbers, you will calculate either negative numbers or imaginary numbers or whatever. Um, so the natural domain of numbers is the complex plane. For me, this is nicely illustrated by the fact that complex numbers were first invented by Cardano and Tartaglia in the 16th century, who were interested in finding the real roots of cubic equations. They discovered that they could compute the real roots of cubic equations if they counted the, the, the square roots of negative, of negative numbers. So, so that illustrates how strongly complex numbers force themselves on your attention if you try and do any kind of mathematics. Okay, so if you do uh, and if you do operations on real numbers, as we know, as they were finding, you get complex numbers. But if you do operations on complex numbers, you only ever get complex numbers. You don't get even more complex numbers like quaternions. There are even more complex numbers than complex numbers, but you don't generate them by doing operations on complex numbers. That's, a, that's just a piece of mathematics. So um, we can you can derive these probability amplitudes using the full panoply of mathematics, you can, you can uh, with, with, without any fear of treading into an unphysical domain, whereas when you're computing probabilities, uh, you have, you're always restricted to the operations you can conduct. And in particular, you can't add probabilities over and over and over. You can't, you can't express the final probability as a sum of an infinite number of non-negligible probabilities, because you'd soon find you had a probability that was bigger than one. Whereas, or a negative probability, because, because the sums involve some negative coefficients. Whereas with, with complex amplitudes, you can add a large and infinite number of non-negligible amplitudes, and you've still got and you've still got a complex number whose mod square is less than one, because you because these are in some sense signed objects and when you add two complex numbers, you don't necessarily have a complex number of bigger one than you started with. So, quantum mechanics is the science of computing amplitudes to sum up for the outcome of some of one measurement, given the amplitudes for the outcomes of other measurements. That's what it is. It's a machine for manipulating these amplitudes. Um, and that machine is made simple by the fact that these amplitudes are complex numbers. Uh, okay. 
So some formalism. So, so a vector, as we all know, is a, is a pair or a triple, <coughs> a quadruple of, 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 of numbers. So a quantum state is a long list of quantum amplitudes. So, so this thing, what does this thing mean in, hard, in a hard-nosed way? This is a quantum state. Well, how do we know what the quantum state is? Well, we write down a long list of amplitudes that the outcome of some measurement would be whatever it is. So, for example, we could write this as the, as the amplitude. This could be the amplitude to find that the energy is E1, and this is the amplitude to find the energy is E2, and so on and so forth. So quantum state is like a vector. It's a long, which, it, it, which, is, which, is, a, which is a finite number of, of, real, of real numbers. <coughs> the quantum state is some number, possibly an infinite number, possibly a finite number, of complex numbers. You can add vectors and rescale them. If you write A and B, the x component is the sum vector is the sum of the x components, and the y component is the sum of the y components. If you rescale it by multiplying by a, a real number s, s, then you multiply all the components. So the same thing if you write a quantum, two quantum states, you add the amplitudes to find E1, you add the amplitudes to find E2, etc. If you rescale and do this, um, you can you can express a vector as a linear combination of the unit vectors on the x, y, and z axes, which then have, uh, <coughs> have components a x, a y, etc. Or you can express this as a linear combination of um, some rotating <coughs> x i prime, j prime, and k prime, some rotating basis vectors. And the same thing is true in the quantum states. I can express <coughs> with this quantum state. There's a linear combination of states of well-defined energy. So E i is playing the role of E1 is playing the role of that, E2 is playing the role of that, E3 is playing the role of that, and so on. Or I could express it as a sum of states of well-defined position with amplitudes given by the wave function, where now this sum is over a continuous variable rather than a discrete one. It's the same idea. So you can express a vector in terms of various different basis <coughs> vectors. You can express a quantum state. This is some of the various different things. And we have this crucial concept of the completeness of states. Um, this is a complete set of states over, over all E i. That is to say, if I measure the energy, I am guaranteed to find that the energy takes one of the values E i. So any state can be written as a sum of these things. If I measure the position, I'm guaranteed to find some, some location x. So uh, any state can be expanded, can be considered to be a sum of these states of well-defined position. Okay. So this is a complete set of, of states, and that's a complete set of states, and there are many different complete sets of states. Okay, so now let's think about composite systems. Systems are often composite, for example, hydrogen <coughs> consists of an electron and a proton. Uh, a measurement consists, as I say, of an instrument and a system that we're measuring and the instrument that we're measuring it with. So let our system consist of parts A and B. Let that be a complete set of states. A I be a complete set of states for A. And as any state of A can be written as a linear combination of those states. And any state of B can be written as a linear combination of these states. Because this is a complete set of states in the system B. Then uh, this state, if this state is the state of A being in the i state and B being in its j state is a state of the composite system, right? Because if I told you how the A system is, I told you how the B system is, I told you all you need to know about the system A and B. Um, and uh, it turns out that any state of the whole system of A and B can be written as a, lin as a linear combination of these states. So these states form a complete set of states for the system A and B. Um, so in this state, they're uncorrelated. If you, if you make a measurement of A, you won't change <coughs> the result of making a measurement of B. You won't change your predictions. You won't change the B state. Uh, you won't change predictions for what result we'll get with B. But we'll see in a minute that most states are correlated. Um, so in general, a, a general state <coughs> of a combined system is of this form. It's a linear combination of those with some coefficient c, i, j in front, right? So for the, the, these things are enumerated, there are, uh, there are, this is the i, j state of the combined system, basic state of the combined system, and the general state of the combined system is a linear combination of these things. And these general states, in this general state, where I have a non-trivial combination,
application here, um, uh, we um, the two A and B systems are correlated. So this is the point: the correlated state, a general correlated state of the combined system, is just expressible as a linear combination of uncorrelated states, which is which is one really simple result that we'd love to have true in, in general. So a bit more about measurement. Um, so we put them into contact, and when we put them into contact, we'll, we'll say that um, our instrument is in this state, and our system is in that state. They're uncorrelated because they haven't had any talk, they haven't been able to talk to each other, so they're uncorrelated. And let's just imagine for the moment that we know what the state of our instrument is, and we uh, and we don't know what that state is, but we know that state is if there is some, it is in one of these states. So then, because we put them into contact with each other, they quickly become entangled. That is just physically because now that they're touching each other, <coughs> the way that the that the atom B evolves depends on the way it's being nudged by the instrument A, and therefore depends, the evolution of B depends on the state of A, and vice versa. So they become entangled, they become correlated, and that's that correlation that we're going to exploit to make the measurement. Um, so after A and B have come into contact, they don't individually have quantum states, because you can't you can't write down anything for B which encapsulates all the relevant information. If you want to, the information you have about B depends upon your information about A and vice versa. So the pair of them have a um, have a state. Sorry, it's written over the page. That's some CIJ, but individually they don't have states. Uh, so the whole system has a quantum state, and that's true of the einstein rosen Podolsky business about. Two, two particles, or two photons under the Danube, or whatever. The photon on one side of the Danube does not have a state independent of the photon on the other side of the Danube because the state of one depends upon the state of the, upon the, state of the other, and vice versa. <coughs> so, this is all part of the insights I, I claim, not in the least, it's uh, mysterious. We now uncouple A from B and we examine A. Uh, and Copenhagen doesn't tell us how to do this examination. Um, and the many worlds people are talking nonsense so much that they don't discuss this. Okay, now how how can we how can we make progress with this? So because A is a macro or even was a mesoscopic thing like a virus, um, with 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 certain uh, we, we are uncertain what its state was pre-measurement because it isn't feasible to make enough measurements on an instrument A to pin down its quantum state. So all we can do is, is describe it by a density operator. What's a density operator? It's a thing like this. So uh, this is one of these states of the instrument, and this is the probability that it's in that state of the instrument. So a density operator is an operator. This, this thing here is an operator, and it's characterized by some States. These states you can easily figure out are eigen, are in fact the eigenvectors of that operator, and eigenvalues. <coughs> and those eigenvalues we interpret as being the probability. I don't know what the state of the instrument is, but I am betting a, with probability p k that it would be found to be in the kth state of this family, and that encapsulates my my understanding of the instrument. So I'm now doing classical probability theory. I'm just assigning a number of probability to something that I'm uncertain about in exactly the same way that I would assign a probability to a uh, lucky lady coming first in some race in the Sandown Park tomorrow. Right? If you don't know what you're, you're not certain about the future, the next best thing you can do is you can place odds on the future, and that's what we're doing. We're describing our knowledge our limited knowledge of the instrument with a thing like this. Okay. Um, and what do you do with a thing like this? With a thing like this, you can calculate the probability, the expectation value of a measurement of a quantity x. It turns out by taking the trace. So x is an operator, and if you multiply this operator on this operator, you have an operator. If you take the trace of that product operator, that gives you the expectation value of x. 
that's how these that's how these density operators work. That's what they do for you. They return you the expectation value of measurements in the presence of both classical probability, classical uncertainty, and the quantum uncertainty associated with measurements. So, what do I think happens? Well, we don't co-evolve, and let's, <coughs> let's, make, let's make our atom the simplest possible thing. Let's make it a two-state system. So we have a plus state and a minus state. So it might be an electron, and we might be talking about the same component of its spin. We talk about spin at the degrees of freedom of an electron, keep things as simple as possible. It's the, the, the quantum system we're investigating is a two-state system. It has a, a complete set of states. It's just a plus state and a minus state. So we can say that any state of the system, the thing before we make the measurement, is a linear combination with quantum amplitude B plus of the plus state and quantum amplitude B minus of the minus state. So what we're saying is we would measure whether it's in the plus or the minus state we would find it was in the plus state with probability b plus mod squared, and it was in the minus state b minus mod squared. Okay, because the state of A was uncertain, the state of AB will be uncertain. The state, so because this instrument was in an uncertain configuration before I made the measurement, when I bring it into contact with the with the um, with the atom, the electron, uh, the thing I'm measuring, the the combination, which is the only thing to which I can assign uh, a weight that logically can have any kind of weight function, uh, will be uncertain. Uh, and it will have to be described by a density operator, rho a b. So there will be some probability uh, that, that a is in its i state and b is in its plus state, and so on. Uh, there will be a long list of such probabilities and they will be wrapped up inside this operator, uh, rho a b. Now, if your instrument is well designed, and I'm not pretending this is easy, of course it's not easy, making instruments is extremely hard. It requires, it requires uh, uh, cunning and subtlety in the design of the dynamics of the device. So this is not, you don't just make an instrument at random, you don't just click your fingers and say, let there be an instrument. Um, so, so, so I can't, I can't uh, exemplify this, I'm just saying, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, uh, but the, name, the job of the instrument maker is yeah, all right, uh, um, have I got all this slide? Uh, Next slide. Yeah, 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 uh, we will write here, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's right. So the job of the instrument maker is to make a mechanical device such that post measurements, the eigenkets of rho are um, the, the eigenkets of rho which carry the large probability, right? So, so there'll be a long list. <coughs> this, this density operator will have a long list of eigenkets because it's the density operator of my big instrument combined with my small atom. And so it will have a lot of, it'll have a lot of, it'll be the, it'll be the density operator for a complicated thing. It'll have a long list of, of eigenkets. But post measurement, um, and with each with each with each eigenket, there will be a probability pi that that the instrument, which the instrument atom combination is in that particular state. We don't. It'll be in some state. We don't know which state, and the pi will be our probabilities. So we want to concentrate, of course, on the states which have large probabilities. So I'm going to say the job of the instrument maker is to make sure that the, that the states that are associated with decent values of pi, not 10 to the minus 36, but maybe 10 to the minus 3, uh, are of the form uh, a state of the instrument n and, and, of course, one of these two things, the plus state, or the state n prime of the instrument and a minus state, where n and n prime, this is the key thing, the states of A that are macroscopically distinguishable. So A, the instrument being complicated, will have a long list of very, will have lots and lots of very similar states. But we, but these states, you, you, the instrument maker's job is to arrange that these states that are associated with significant probability fall into fairly distinct groups. And by taking a very rough assessment of the state of the instrument, we'll be able to conclude for, 
uh, in fact, it's, sorry, I've done it again. We're going to be able to conclude that it is, and I've done it again again. So we want we want the outcome of this this correlation to be that that most of the properties of site is associated with with states that are like this that cleanly separate into a well defined what one of the states we're interested in a B uh, and a state and the states that fall in some class N which is rather different, quantitatively different from the class N prime. For example, these states are one electron volt lower than those states. And then they're separated perhaps by pico electron volts. So I can't tell which state it's in. I can't distinguish between the states down here um, because they're separated by such a small amount and things that I can measure. But I can tell the difference between an N state and an N prime state. And then if I if I take a cursory inspection of my equipment and find it's in an end state, I can conclude that this interaction has left my electron in a plus spin state. Or if I find it's in a different class of states, one of these, it must have been left in the minus state. That I think is how measurements have to work. But more than that, it has to be that if you take the sum of all the probabilities associated with its being in one of these things, which is a statement about the nature of this density operator that emerges from that interaction, then the sum of those probabilities should be equal to B plus mod squared. So, you, so the because the probability that you find your instrument is in one of these states is given by that. The sum of the PMs over all the states in that class. And the probability that you find it in one of these states is going to be the sum of the, the PN primes of all the P's associated with that class, and these, so, so this is the probability that your instrument is giving <coughs> you the answer N, this is the probability of your instrument giving the N prime, and this, but if, it, if your instrument's reading N, then you've left, then the instrument has left the spin in the plus state, and the, the Copenhagen people tell us the probability that it's in the plus, that the measurement finds that it's in the plus state is P, P plus squared. So this is what the instrument builder has to ensure that these things happen. Okay. I think that is all I wanted to say. Here's my summary. So the point about quantum mechanics is to be grown up and to recognize that, that measurement inevitably implies disturbance. And that makes, uh, and the other essence of quantum mechanics is that we compute probabilities always using a probability amplitude method. First computing a complex number and then taking it mod squared. The second statement here is extraordinary and completely mysterious. And the first is highly inconvenient but very obvious. Um, the results of measurements are uncertain because the initial state of the measurement equipment is uncertain. And that the measurement equipment infects your system with its own uncertainty. Copenhagen steps around the complexity of the measurement problem by modeling reproducible measurements. It chose to model reproducible measurements. That wasn't forced on it. It was an idealization, other idealization possible, but that was the one that it chose. And there are totally unreal, unreal idealizations, and one needs to be clear about that. Still, we work with these, with these hypothetical states in which the result of one measurement is certain, because we, this is how we know how to compute. We know how to use these idealizations, like we know how to use um, <coughs> perfect lines and perfect triangles in the field of geometry. Uh, it's not surprising that these states are unphysical, uh, but so are other things that we work with. Um, it's very much to be expected that we cannot be sure of, of being able to measure both x, well, but if we measure x precisely, we won't know what the outcome of a P measurement is, or if we measure P precisely, we won't know what the result of measurement X is. This is very much to be expected. Um, there's no, what, there's no, nothing mysterious happens when we make a measurement. Uh, all we do is we generate correlations 
between our instrument and our system, and the Copenhagen interpretation chooses not to go into the mechanics of the development of this correlation. So it could do, but it doesn't do. It could, and the reason it doesn't is because the, the, the details of this depend upon the precise construction of the measuring instrument. Right? Because that, in, that in, the development of that entanglement depends on the Hamiltonian of the measuring instrument and the interaction Hamiltonian between the measuring instrument and the system. And Siemens does that one way, Bauer Bosch does it another way, and so on and so forth. Lots of instruments does it another way. So that's, that's a particularity, not a generality. So it skips over all of that and just talks about uh, the result. Um, it would be very good to tease out these details in specimen cases. Um, and you, in doing so, you'd have to go a bit beyond Copenhagen because Copenhagen, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation always just talks about, and then they measured and the wave function collapsed. So you have to, you, uh, in order to make contact with reality, you, 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 you have to escape. So Copenhagen makes contact with reality with a step which we're precisely trying to elucidate. So you have to go beyond Copenhagen in order to elucidate it. Um, and I think these, this many world stuff is just obfuscation which distracts people from the concrete task in a way, which I think is to understand how this happens. In some specimen cases, I don't think it's ever going to be, we're never going to want to do this in general, but I think it would be nice to be sure that the sort of thing that I have hypothesized is the way that measuring equipment works. It does work in, in some specimen cases, and then we can get on with using Copenhagen in the confident, um, in sure that we understood what was happening. Well, thank you. I don't think the density operators just have it. <coughs> well, let's talk about this afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Why do we consider ourselves as observers to be uh, any more special than our measurement devices? You say our measurement device becomes entangled with the system, yeah. and then we make the measurement by the measurement device. Why do we want to say we become entangled with the measurement? Well, you are entangled. That's physically what's happening. So why do we make a distinction? Why not? 
and why we even have a measurement problem, why we just sort of consider ourselves as being entangled. I mean, if you look at a great head over space and just the system, it's really just a larger pure state. So, well, that was just not helpful because. But then you're kind of avoiding, you're, you're saying that we need to sort of determine how we make a measurement of the measurement device without skipping over how the device is then doing the same thing with the actor. But I think people do make measurements. They write things down in their, well, they used to write them in their notebooks and they'll stick them on their discs, right? They, they reduce their experience to the numbers. But the device is doing the same thing in its own way. Why do we distinguish between the two? I mean, the Sorry, but I, I just think we're trying. I mean, we. I just. This is a theory which is what we're trying to do here is 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 get a, is is get predictions for what numbers you should write down. That you will write down in your notebook or on your disk. But if you're doing that, then why do you need to understand what the measurement is? I mean, the mathematics is the same in any. Well, because I well I have somehow so at some point I have to get out of the mathematics. Uh, something that I can compare with clocks and stuff that I'm going to publish in the journal. But, but I'm not saying that I'm existentially um, entangled with my, with my atoms. This is a publishable statement. But you are, I mean, you're, you're sort of saying that we... So, so the mathematics will allow us, allows us to make all the predictions we need for the papers. Any, any only via only via some understanding of the measurement process, right? Only only in the far ends. We have to get our probability distributions. Yeah. But then why do we need to understand how the measurement occurs if the mathematics works independent of our, of our own interpretation of what the measurement actually is? I mean all, all these theories of measurement, they all produce the same results mathematically, it's just yeah, well, well, one, one wants to understand <coughs> and you one wants to know what's really happening. In, in which case, why do we make the distinction between ourselves and the measurement device? Because I don't read myself, I read the measuring device. But the measurement device reads the atom, but you're considering that to be a different process to you reading the measurement device. Yeah, because because I think it really is, because the measuring device is big enough that I don't have to worry about this disturbance. But you could still write, I mean, it, it's, it's a massive hill of space in it. You've still got a pure state I mean, we could have been, I mean, if we, if we, if we don't have some step like this, we just end in infinite regrets. And we never get any numbers to write in our book. It, it kind of feels like you're just thinking of that whole point to which you kind of go, well, I don't want to know what happens. I'm trying to do, I mean, I think we're trying to describe real life. Real experiment. And there is a point at which, at which, experience, at which the, the subtleties of, of, of what happens in the lab are reduced to mere numbers. <coughs> it's a crystallization, and it, and it just does happen. And so I think you have to model The interpretation isn't the same as the model. The model is the mathematics we have, and that works. Well, you, I mean, the Copenhagen interpretation works, yeah. So that, that's not the mathematics. That's well, these things at those amplitudes are, are the probabilities with which you will get certain outcomes when you measure. But, I'm, but one wants to ask, what does it mean to measure? I didn't invent the idea of measurement. It's in the foundations of the theory from the beginning. But if you want to say what the final state of the system is to a given observer, you don't need to understand how the measurement process actually works in the interpretation you just need to mathematics. You've got mathematics, and the mathematics has to, the, the state of the quantum state isn't uh, isn't something that leads to publication. What leads to publication is the result of some sort of measurement. But you can still express that. No, no, you can't publish a quantum state. What do you mean? You know, if you publish a histogram of, of, of readings on some instrument. Yeah, I, I don't buy it. Okay, well, well sorry, but maybe we should talk about that. I'm not sure we're making progress. Please. 
Um, yeah, so um, I was just saying in the beginning, I'm not a huge fan of this whole collapse theory. So, um, but I was wondering how you make sense of the bell inequalities or just how you deal with the, with the topic of non locality in general. Um, I don't find any kind of problem with the bell inequalities, as I say, because the, the two particles are correlated, they became correlated when you created a pair, you know, you have a spin zero, classically a spin zero pair of particles. And that, what does that mean? Well, it means that um, uh, it, it, it means that the two spins, <coughs> first of all, spins because S X doesn't commute with S Y doesn't commute with S Z. A uh, spin vector is something that we find a little hard to cope with um, because so it's not like a momentum vector. It doesn't have a well-defined orientation. The most we ever know about it is whether it's pointing in the north end hemisphere or the southern hemisphere or the eastern hemisphere or the western hemisphere, and you get to choose which hemispheres you talk about. And Alice and Bob talk about different, you know, make different decisions as to which hemisphere they're going to inquire about. So again, uh, this is coming back to what I said that um, spin isn't spin isn't an intrinsic property of of the, of the object. It's a question you can ask: What is your component of spin in this direction? You mustn't think about you get into a trouble if you think about the spin vector as pointing in some particular direction. Um, and uh, so these people ask different questions, but it, because they are a spin zero pair, um, before you made any measurements, they were pointing in opposite directions. But when Alice decides to measure the spin in this direction, she jogs the spin, and she, all she ever discovers is that originally it was pointing in the northern hemisphere. And what does that mean? That means that whatever Bob measures, there's only one result. There's only one result he, he can't get, which is that, it's, that he, he finds that it's pointing uh, bang in, the, in, in exactly the same direction. But any, in any direction he chooses other than the direction that Alice has chosen, he has some chance of finding it because, because we know that Bob's spin is in the southern hemisphere, but we don't know where in the southern hemisphere. And any, any hemisphere he chooses, has, except for the northern hemisphere, has some overlap with the southern hemisphere. So he has some probability of finding the point of direction. So, so I, I don't think there is any problem. Uh, there is any non-locality problem or anything. People get into a tangle because they think the spin vector is pointing in some direction, and it's not. And that's why people get into a tangle with relativity by assuming that there is, by thinking in terms of absolute time. Physics forces you to give up naive ideas from time to time, and the idea that a, a spin points in some particular direction is one of those ideas you have to give up. It has a hemisphere, no more. Um, I'm sure it's important to be able to stay for a while to answer any more questions. Um, yeah, I think there should be some snack upstairs. Some snacks upstairs. Uh, we will have committee elections probably upstairs. Uh, we're just going to talk through. I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Um, once again, thank you for coming to the